Hello, I'm Paige Howard, and you are watching Mr. Media. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to screenwriters Charlotte Barrett and Sean Fallon, whose first film, Virgin Alexander, will be out on DVD on July 17th. Stick around, virgins will be exposed. Um, you know, that may not have come out exactly the way I intended it. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of first-timers in so many things in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Don't worry, hasn't moved at all. <laughs> <laughs> I met my wife on the job. I was a music critic at the St. Petersburg Times, and she was usually the late editor fixing my grammatical errors, spelling mistakes, and non sequiturs. It was a great professional relationship that mushroomed into a personal one, and we've been together now almost 25 years, including one teenager, five dogs, and a house. But when we tried to work together on projects outside of the institutional setting of newspaper articles, it nearly rendered the union asunder. We were, are, two very strongly opinionated people who might show some give to other people, but not to each other, at least not in professional matters. She edited my first two books, and that was it. <clears throat> I don't think she's even read any of the ten books since then, which frankly is just as well. Uh, so, you know, I'm always fascinated with how other married couples do it. And that brings me to today's guest, Charlotte Barrett and Sean Fallon a young couple who met while studying film production at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. They eventually worked together as writers for David Letterman and are now on the verge of seeing their first film, Virgin Alexander, released on DVD. And it will be in stores and for sale online July 17th. Now, I admire that they've been able to work together and live together, and I'm curious to know how they do it. Charlotte Barrett and Sean Fallon, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for not breaking up during the introduction. That's all I got to say. Still, still here, still <laughs> sitting next to each other. It, it, it occurred to me that the longer the introduction got, the, uh, the, the the greater the odds were that you wouldn't make it through. So thank you for <laughs> that. Just drift apart. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So congratulations on the movie. I, and it's fu funny. I I had uh, Paige Howard, who's in the movie, on a week ago, and I actually I'm going to say the same thing to you that I said to her about her appearance in 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 your movie and uh, her other movie. Uh, uh, cheesecake casserole it seems to me this is a pretty big uh, opportunity and a pretty pretty big moment for you guys yes yeah. we were i mean we're we're really excited um uh, we really like how the film turned out and um it's it's done very well on the festival circuit and, and we have this incredible cast and we got a much better cast than what we pitched our investors absolutely absolutely and and um it's you know it all kind of uh came together really beautifully and so we're excited to kind of get the dvd out in the world and and get responses. Now everyone can see it. Exactly. And I've seen it, and I, I enjoyed it. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a sweet film, uh, considering that the topic is uh, this uh, twenty-six-year-old virgin. Uh, now you know it, I like that it's a twenty-six-year-old virgin, not a forty-year-old virgin. That for me was a little too much of a stretch. Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> and there's no. Uh, is this horrible if I say? Well, uh, there's no, uh, there's no sex, sex going on. There is one topless scene, which I, I guess you got to do to get the right rating that you want for the topic. But um, it's a very sweet film. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Alexander is a virgin. Uh, you know, because the movie is about a virgin who opens a brothel in his house. But uh, he has much bigger issues going on than his, just his uh, V card status. And, Absolutely. you know, so, you know, he's got to deal with a whole lot of other personal issues before he can even attempt to uh, lose his virginity. Yes. Yes. 
that's just like the symptom of uh, and we, we didn't want to present like it is a sweet film even though it, it sounds like it would be dirty and it sounds like it would be raunchy we wanted to play with those expectations and have it be a surprisingly sweet movie where like you almost don't even realize how dirty it actually is absolutely absolutely and and um you know we really uh, approached the subject matter um with you know, we didn't want to judge our characters. We um, never wanted to make fun of them. Never wanted to make fun of them. Everybody has reasons uh, for doing what they do, um, and so so we definitely approached it with like a, you know maybe a lighter touch, and and we and we have a bunch of different kinds of comedy in the in the film, highbrow, lowbrow, um, all that stuff. So yeah, we're really yeah. excited about it. Now there's a lot of stuff going on there, and uh, besides uh, Paige Howard. Uh, the uh, uh, Alexander is played by uh, Rick. F- is it Fano? Fanya. 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 Uh, and uh, you've also got Bronson Pinchot uh, in the film in a, a very interesting role. <laughs> He's fantastic. Yeah. A surprisingly sweet role as well. That, Absolutely. That, you know, could be could be a lot dirtier. Yes. Well, yes. there's a but... lot of stuff implied in this role. <laughs> Your heart kind of goes out to him. You yeah. Know? <laughs> that was. Whereas you know. Um, he he's kind of technically you know the heavy um, in the in the film, but he's not he's not really a bad guy. Um, he just he's just in a bad situation, and he and uh, he just makes choices. He makes choices that maybe I wouldn't make, maybe you wouldn't make, Bob, <laughs> but he does. I'm, I'm thinking, would I make those choices? I'm <laughs> Let me get back to you on that. Let me get back exactly. to you on that. Um, that's, so tell me about. Uh, no, it's interesting to me in in, in reading. Uh, you guys have had. Uh, leading up to this, you've had some good success with uh, uh, screenplays that have done well in contests, and mm-hmm. and, and I think that uh, over here, one of your uh, uh, unproduced screenplays was a, a, a big buzz uh, screenplay for a while. It did. It did well in the um, in the Nichols uh, Fellowship um, through the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Sciences, um, and that was our first kind of collaboration. Um, that was the first script that we wrote together. Um, after after NYU, we started writing on our own. Um, wrote a couple of screenplays, and um, we kept on, you know, kind of looking each other, looking over each other's shoulder. And and then finally, we decided like, hey, let's try to do this together. And then that's kind of you know what started our collaboration as as screenwriters and and filmmakers. I mean, we you know during school we had like you know worked on each other's projects. Like he would produce my short film, I would assist and direct his short film. I you know so so that's kind of. You know, over here was the beginning of our um, collaboration. Prof- professional collaboration. Yeah. And uh, what made uh, Virgin Alexander come to fruition uh, as opposed to previous efforts? Uh, I, you know, it, uh, I would say that uh, it could be done cheaply. That helped. And, you know, as we wrote, like, you know, that over here is our first screenplay together. And I, I think our writing just got better, it got a lot tighter. And um, we started, you know, like knowing what we wanted to write about and knowing, you know, what we wanted to explore. And we started writing, you know, each after over here, each trip we wrote, we were thinking, you know, as a possibility to direct because, you know, we wanted to direct. We always wanted to direct, but we didn't go, you know, the route through making music videos or making short films. We did short films in college, but then nothing afterwards because, you know, it doesn't cost anything to write. Writing's free, whereas a short film, you know, could cost just several thousand dollars and, you know, we're kind of cheap when it comes to a budget, so. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and, and definitely, um, you know, paper's, paper's cheap, and also, you know, you can make mistakes on paper cheaply, um, and, and, you know, it just takes rewriting, um, you know, a scene as opposed to, like, a reshoot. So, we, yeah, we really focus on storytelling and, you know, just sharpening our storytelling skills, and then by the time Virgin Alexander came along, everything just aligned where we met up with a producer out of Austin, Texas, and... You know, he had a business plan, and he liked our ideas for the movie, and everything just really came together nicely. Yeah, very, very quickly, very quickly. Hmm. And the film, uh, speaking of budget, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking this must have been a consideration. The film was shot in uh, Sean's hometown of Saratoga Springs. Yes. Uh, was that a budget consideration? Is that just absolutely? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Uh, it was never. It was never written for Saratoga. We, we, you know, we wrote it. Uh, just to be a miscellaneous small town, American small town. And uh, when our producer came on board, we started looking at, you know, where can we shoot this thing? Where does it make sense? And he's based out of Austin. And there's so many shoots in Austin uh, now that he wanted to look into that. And, you know, but it's starting to get expensive to shoot in Austin. Uh, you know, restaurants know they 
can charge you and they can charge you quite a bit. And so, you know, I got thinking about Saratoga. It's such a beautiful town. And uh, it turns out Saratoga now has a film commissioner, which is was crazy for me to discover that. And so we met with the film commissioner and found out that they actually got rid of their film permit requirement. So, you know, you don't have to pay a cop to be on set for 12 hours a day, which just for an indie film like that's just prohibitively expensive. And Saratoga is really known uh, for horse racing. They have a horse track that's every summer, every August. And so Seabiscuit shot there. Robert Redford's a horse whisperer shot there. That, you know, and they're looking to expand beyond uh, horse themed movies. <laughs> that's why they got rid of the film permit requirement because they want to try to encourage outside productions that are that are not horse themed uh, to shoot there, including low budget indie films. So they, you know, could not have been more helpful. And, and because like Saratoga doesn't get a lot of shoots, you're a novelty. You know, when you go into a restaurant and say like, "Hey, we would love to shoot here." They're thrilled. Like, their restaurant's going to be in a movie? Like, that's great. Do you need us to close down? Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, without having film permits, I mean, we discovered, you know, we could shoot wherever we wanted in town. We just need a location owner's permission. I mean, so, you know, the city allowed us to shut down streets and kind of do all these crazy things that Normally. we would never be allowed to do in New York, L.A., Austin. Or we would be able to do it. It would just, we wouldn't be able to make the film for the budget we have. And it's also a really nice um, location, too, uh, because you're just a train ride away from New York City. Um, and, the you know, tons of actors and, 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 and crew that can help you. And, and it definitely in the, in the Capital District, there are a, a lot of local crew as well that we, um, we utilized, which was great. Mm-hmm. And uh, the fact that you didn't have to have a, a, a cop on set, probably pretty convenient for a, a film that's uh, shooting a, 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 a home that's been converted to a horror house. <laughs> it, well, there are no, there are no actual sex act going on. There are, uh, you know, Bronson's subplot where he's in the basement doing what he does. Uh, that was actually my sister's basement. Yes. It wasn't the Mexican restaurant. My sister, <laughs> you know, we were grabbing, you know, for to, Alexander is a scrap hauler and his house is filled with a ton of junk. So in order to fill the house, we, you know, went to garage sales. We went to everyone's basement. I knew to like try to pillage basically and um we were in my sister's and i saw she had a wooden stall a toilet and a stall and we're like why do you have this she said, i don't know it's always it been happened. here and so we painted it the colors of the mexican restaurant and uh yeah that's my sister's basement yes and and whose home will live in infamy as uh, I, I think this was mika borum uh, who does the the the, the topless shot uh, at, at no the- that's uh that's actually uh liz Masu- elizabeth masucci she uh, she was just in uh, Shame with uh, Michael Fassbender that movie, uh, but that house was actually uh, it was actually built in 1824. Uh, just this great old house that had so many weird additions put onto it, and you know had no air conditioning. And it was incredibly hot. Incredibly hot, and you could feel the walls just. Hey, the, the house was like falling down. Basically, the house was actually slated for uh, demolition after the shoot. So we were able to actually sneak in there and, you know, get everything we needed. That's why we could destroy the back porch, you know, for lighting. We were able to cut holes in the ceiling. And, uh, yeah, and we were able to do that all because, you know, a couple weeks after the shoot ended, the house was demolished. So it was like this great house's last hurrah. Yes. So no, no, no film tour in Saratoga Springs to point out. That's the house. That's a yeah. lot. Yeah, you can see a <laughs> Beautiful now. lot. Yes. Now I, I, I Charlotte, I got to ask you this. I mean, I, I love, uh, I love movies like Porky's and American Pie and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, this movie is not. It's not full of gratuitous uh, moments. Yeah. But, but that moment. Uh, we're, we're and, and I apologize to Mika for getting the the the, the uh, actresses backwards, but I, it's you know as a, as a woman who's written you know co co-authored right. the script, do you have any problem in in you know writing that kind of scene and setting that up? You know, actually, it's it's a really interesting scene. You know, there's there's nudity um, in movies. You know, I mean, especially those you know '80s comedies that that you mentioned. I mean. I remember watching those as a kid and being like, why is that girl topless? Like, there's no purpose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, gratuitous it's, nudity. it's gratuitous. But, you know, in, in, that, in the case of, of, of that specific scene, um, it's so much more uh, intimidating um, when a, an amazingly beautiful woman um, is incredibly smart and, and basically she rips open our lead character of Alexander. I mean, she is telling him his life. And and I think what makes people maybe a little bit more uncomfortable with that kind of nudity, that it's a monologue, you know, um, 
where she's topless is that it isn't sexual. <laughs> and because we have, I mean, you know, uh, a few minutes, like right after that scene, we have a scene in a, in a strip club and there's uh, a stripper character who's been in the movie and, you know, she's topless for a moment. No one's ever commented on that nudity because she's in a strip club and, well, that's, that's normal. You're meant to see it. And, you know, whenever people says, like, I can't, you know, you have nudity in your movie in this one scene, it's like, no, we have nudity in another scene, but you're just so accustomed to that that you don't notice it. Uh, it it's funny, that scene... You know, to, to set it up, there's a scene where uh, one of the, the girls, the prostitutes in the house, uh, basically gets into an argument with Alexander. She happens to be topless. And it's so much more visceral. It's, Absolutely. you know, it, it basically, you know, it, it's so much more powerful to Alexander with her being topless. Because it's much, I mean, uh, truly intimidating. You know, he, he, is, he is a virgin. He has no experience with women. Um, and and then like one of the most beautiful women that he's probably going to encounter is topless in front of him, basically yelling at him and, and telling and telling him about his life um, and not being sexy, like not and and she's not embarrassed of her body. Um, she's not, you know, ashamed, of her, she's yeah. not ashamed of her body as a, as opposed to him where he is very closed off and very it has tight. layers on. Yes. Yeah. So so it's it's I really I really love that scene um, and. And I really, you know, it, it always kind of gets gets gasps, gasps when we screen the screen the film, and um, and it's just interesting to see people's people's reaction because I don't, you know, that scene like kind of makes me feel empowered as a woman because like that she's using all of her um, she she's using all of her weapons against him to try to break him down and 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 get him to realize like you need to stop. You just you need to take a look at yourself and reevaluate your life and your choices and your choices. Um, and there is no other. I mean, why why is she going to put on a shirt? Like that's just for him. It's not for her, and she doesn't need it. So it's kind of cool. I don't know. Now you you do know that uh, in the next few days when it when it pops up on Mr. Skin, it'll lose all the context you just gave it. <laughs> and that's that's totally. Funny. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like. Uh, you know, Robert Altman has a great movie, Shortcuts, and uh, Julianne right. Moore gets into an argument with Matthew Modine, and uh, it's after she spilled wine on her pants, and she, you know, there's a dinner party about to happen, so she's trying to clean them, and she's not wearing any pants. You know, she's not wearing any underwear, and so Julianne Moore is just bottomless in this scene, and it's so much more intimidating to Matthew Modine, and, you know, because the scene's not about that. It just, you're not going to stop what you're doing to, like, wait. I want to. I want to yell at you. I want to have this argument, but I need to get dressed. Like yeah. your emotions take over. Yeah. All right. So, so I asked you about that ostensibly to ask you about this. <laughs> so, uh, Channing Tatum, uh, actor Channing Tatum, returned to the Tampa Bay area where I am recently uh, to shoot uh, the, the story of his early life as a young guy. Right. This Magic Mike, which was released uh, as we're talking. Uh, it's about being a male stripper, and I, I thought it was uh, interesting that uh, he went back to his original hometown to shoot this movie, and uh, that was about his life. And uh, Sean, you've taken your movie uh, back to Saratoga Springs to <laughs> shoot this. So I'm just wondering if there's anything that maybe you'd like to tell us about the connection. I like I like the connections you're making. <laughs> uh, no, no, sadly, uh, or not sadly, uh, you know the. Because it is like the film itself, it is, you know, it's a commercial comedy. It's, you know, and it, it does have these, you know, kind of it, like it sounds like it would be like an American Pie or a Porky's. But, you know, when people when people go in to that, when they go into the movie thinking they're going to see that, they're usually disappointed because it, disappointed. it, it doesn't really deliver that. Um, but, uh, you know, for us, it is a personal film, even though it is just, you know, about a virgin open a brothel in his house. Um, because, you know, Alexander also plays piano and he's trying to go to college, but he can't afford it. And he's trapped in his, you know, his home's going into foreclosure and he feels trapped by his surroundings. And he has this art he wants to express, but he's not able to do that. He, you know, outside, you know, outside forces are stopping him. And so that's something we could relate to. And I think a lot of people can as well, but even though, you know, but we take a, you know, a kind of commercial and broad concept to explore those issues and those feelings exactly yeah all right last question about saratoga springs <laughs> so um uh charlotte he uh he he brings you in this production to his hometown uh, uh you, you i'm sure you'd been there before uh but yes. uh 
you, you, you had an extended stay there. Did he uh, did he suggest that this might be a nice t place to put down some roots? That it was great to grow up there. Any of that kind of stuff? No, no. We uh, <laughs> we lived. You know, I, I lived with my in laws um, for a few months, um, and uh, you that was know, intense. I won't even I, <laughs> see. I won't even ask. I, mean, I won't like, even my, ask. My mom helped out, you know, with catering, and my mom was on set every day, and you know, it was amazing. But. Uh, I'm good. I, I've spent enough time in Saratoga. Yeah. No, I mean, we, you know, we, we like to, because we don't live in, in, in my hometown, like, either. You know, I'm, I'm sure my family would really like um, me to move back to San Antonio. But we've just, you know, we kind of wanted to make our home in, in other places. And, and we kind of move around a lot. I mean, that's kind of what we've done so far. We're gypsies. We, yeah, we're gypsies. We consider ourselves gypsies. <laughs> um, but definitely, uh, Sean uh, literally never mentioned that, ever. <laughs> 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 Got it. Just had to ask. Just had to ask. And uh, last question of, uh, about about the film. Uh, it occurred to me while we've been talking that I seem to recall that uh, uh, Paige Howard's uh, background was that she also went to the Tisch School. Did you guys overlap? No. no. Uh, she. I think like her first year might have been our last year. Yeah. But we didn't know each other. And also our uh, lead actor, Rick Fonio, he's Tisch as well. He went to NYU Tisch in the acting program. Uh, and he, like, yeah, we overlap. Like his last year was our, we transferred in. Yeah. It was one of our first years. Um, and yeah, nobody, nobody knew each other. It was weird. But it was, it was weird, just, weird NYU connection. sponsored yeah. project. It seems like. <laughs> but, but those uh, Tish alumni looking out for each other one way or the other. Apparently. It's a, good, it's a good school. Yeah. It's a really good school. We had a good time. Very nice. So, uh, I want to change subject uh, a little bit before we, uh, uh, start to wrap up. Uh, you guys worked uh, for uh, David Letterman for a time. We did. We did. We worked at the um, worked at the Late Show. I actually worked in the Page program, so like I shuffled the audience. Jacket. Yeah, I wore a Letterman jacket, um, and I worked outside, worked inside, rain, shine, snow. Um, it's freezing outside. It's freezing inside the theater, so. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> Doesn't make a difference. Um, I would I would be in my like several layers, Letterman jacket, hat, gloves, <laughs> watching, watching, um, Dave do a show. Um, but that's, yeah, so that's, we, we did that after, after college. Um, our, our, a friend of ours from NYU was already working there and kind of, um, got me the job and then, and then you the also job. worked in the audience department as well. Um, and then one of our, one of our actors in our film, uh, his name's Kevin McCaffrey. He's one of the, uh, bachelor party guys. He's like the main bachelor party guy, not, not Trent, the redhead, but like, you know, the second in command. And, uh, he's a writer for Letterman now. And he also, uh, he's a stand up, but you know, that's, so we met him at Letterman. So yeah, there's a as connection well. to the movie. Yeah. Very cool. And I got to ask you about this, uh, and, and maybe you won't have a sense of it. Maybe you will, but tell me, uh, I heard him. He rarely does interviews. You know, he, re he rarely allows himself to be interviewed. But uh, he was on uh, Alec Baldwin's uh, Got a Podcast. Yeah. Uh, here's the thing. Did yeah, you, we listened to that. We listened to that, yeah. I mean, it was just uh, amazing the way he just kind of opened up. And the thing, that, the thing that struck me was he was talking about all those years um, of, of uh, the NBC show and that he was so freaking intense that all he was all consumed by the show, and he was a miserable human being, basically, and and that you know he put off uh, marriage and he put off having a kid uh, because it was all the show. Every you know he was involved in everything, and he was just this so wrapped tight guy. But then I, I guess he uh, over the more recent years let that kind of go, and he says he doesn't even participate in the production of the staff meetings anymore. He just shows up and he does the show. And from your perspective. Um, which may be a little too far. I don't know. Did you have that sense of him the way he described himself? No, I mean, you know, like he, you know, it's, he's the captain of the ship. So, you know, there's, there is a natural intensity towards that. But I mean, we, you know, we worked there the years like right after he had his son and, you know, you'd see him playing with his son. Yeah. It was like really sweet. And, like, cause you all, everyone's always heard the intense Dave stories. But like his staff is like so loyal. I mean, like, yeah. you know, yeah, people I just mean, love him. And like, you'd see him, you know, playing with his son and yeah. going out on 53rd street with his son. It was just, you know, really nice. Yeah. It was a really fun place to work. Um, and it was, we, we met a lot of, um, you know, young people that are into comedy, um, which is, which is great. It's like a little Mecca for that in New York. Um, so it, it, we have, we have no complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Sounds like, sounds like a good, uh, job out of college, uh, 
Certainly. Yeah, it was, really, it was really fun. See elements of the business that you wouldn't otherwise see, I'm sure. So, uh, okay, so this movie uh, opens uh, uh, about two and a half uh, weeks from now as we're talking. And um, do you have, you have something else that you're working on? Have you finished something? Where, where, what's, the pro- what's going on? Well, we're writing, you know, basically uh, our next script and talking to investors about funding that. And, uh, you know, because we spend, you know, you make the movie and then we spend a year about that on the festival, film festival circuit and then also dealing with distribution and working out, you know. But now that that's all over, we can just focus on writing and writing our next script. And uh, we think we'll be shooting in Charlotte's hometown next, yes. San Antonio. <laughs> Let's say we can we can uh, regroup in you know yeah, two years definitely. and see if I want to move to San Antonio. Definitely, that would be good. And uh, I gotta I want to ask you a question that's very personal, and I apologize for it in advance. No, it's not that question. Um, can you are you actually at this point in your careers uh, doing a an indie uh, comedy like this and then preparing to do another one? Can you make a living like this, or are you you know uh, is it? I mean, you, <laughs> it's, know. you know, it's not it's not easy. No. Um, no, and you have to you have to do other things. You know, we can, you you know, it, it can't necessarily be the only thing you do. Especially like you know, it depends on the budget of your film and how much Absolutely. you know how much you allocate towards yourself. And you know, in the back of our minds is any any penny we're getting is a penny that's not up on the screen necessarily. Yeah, you know? yeah, definitely. Um, it's uh, you have to do other you have to do other things. That's what pretty much. Which is which is great. Which is fine. But I mean, that's kind of. You know how it always is when when we worked when we uh, when we first moved to L.A. You know Charlotte was a dog walker. I worked in a uh, uh, for a company that made movie trailers, and I was in the tape room, which is, had all these electronics, and I had to make copies of DVDs of movie trailers before they went to the executives. And you know it's it's a big room with a lot of electronics, but it's it's not very hard. And I kind of told like kind of convinced him like this job's really taxing like i need to be left alone i had a lot of high security projects so i was like the sex in the city movie six months before it came out so i was behind a locked door so people left me alone and we were basically on the phone all day writing you know yeah. talking to each other about scenes and typing and you know you just kind of have to do whatever it takes and yeah. get yourself in you know get yourself a job where you, you know we wanted to write so we got jobs where we could write all day but still do other things that let us live yeah. Live. Yeah. <laughs> gave us income to exist. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, folks, listen, uh, you can find uh, Charlotte Barrett and uh, Sean Fallon's first film, Virgin Alexander, starring, uh, you'll have to help me if I get this wrong, Rick Fo- Fogno? Fogno. Fogno. The G is silent. Fogno. I thought I had it. Okay. I, so I got it backwards again. Uh, Paige Howard and, of course, the amazing Bronson Pinchot. Uh, in stores uh, and uh, online nas- nationwide on July 17th. Uh, you can also order it uh, right now, uh, pre-order it at a great price at mrmedia.com via Amazon. Uh, the website for the film is virginalexander.com. Very clever URL. I like that. <laughs> um, are you guys uh, individually, do you do uh, Twitter or Facebook, any of that kind of stuff? We're both on Twitter, you know, at Sean Fallon. At Charlie R. Barrett. Um, and we're on, we're on Facebook. Virgin Alexander's on Facebook. And Virgin um, Alexander's on Twitter. At Virgin Alexander. And folks, don't forget to visit lovely Saratoga Springs. <laughs> By all means. Beautiful area. <laughs> tell that Virgin Alexander brought you there. Please. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Uh, Charlotte Barrett and Sean Fallon, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. 
Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The TechCrunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, BlackBerry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.